Hi, this is your host Swapnil Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFI Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Julian Fisher, CEO of any Nice. Julian, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here too. Yeah, uh, there are so much to talk about uh, for the last couple of months. We have been running different series there. One was on cost efficiency. This month we are running a series on security and compliance. So I want to hear when you look at any Nice, uh, the customers that you are serving and you do serve customers uh, where you are touching because cost efficiency is becoming a big topic we talked about in our previous discussion as well. So I want to hear from you, how is any nines helping customers first with becoming more cost efficient and at the same time also make sure that their workloads, application environments are secure and compliant? Well, the cost efficiency aspect is uh, mostly about um, uh, operational efficiencies and um, and the general pricing model that we come uh, that we uh, that we offer. So often we have migration cases where customers save up to fifty percent in total cost of ownerships, uh, adapting our platform technologies compared to uh, alternative offerings. So it's not that we have to do much to uh, to get those cost efficiencies ready. It's basically built into our pricing model. Uh, when it comes to security, um, I think the experience of working with large enterprises for a while gives you a good feeling about what their security officers are looking for when uh, looking at uh, you know cloud software automation. Um, so, for example, the way we set up uh, access, uh, uh, accessing the environment uh, environments, the way we set up VPNs, the way generally networking is set up uh, and secured. Those are things you have to get right when talking to clients like that. So it basically comes from experience. Um, when you look at um, the connection between uh, application runtimes, uh, whether this is Cloud Foundry or whether this is Kubernetes and data service automation, uh, obviously you have uh, TCP connections there. So you'd be looking at um, questions such as how do you protect data in transit how do you protect data at rest? So encryption is obviously a, a very important thing. So these features are basically present, um, and we know how to apply them. Um, that that helps to get um, a lot of these security questions answered. Now, in general, um, a lot of companies out there they they follow a software as a service uh, pattern where they basically rent out resources they, they host in their own, uh, let's say, AWS account, and so other people can connect using public endpoints. Um, well, while we do that with parsany9s.com, uh, in the enterprise uh, part of Any9s, which is you know by, by far the larger one, uh, we allow the software to be operated from within the Amazon account of the customer or from on-premise data centers. So. From the security perspective, that gives them uh, a huge benefit because they have control over their own software operations. Uh, they basically can run it on their own infrastructure uh, or an infrastructure. You know, they have, um, you know, they control the account of and therefore also who is allowed to access it. One more topic that we ran was about DevOps versus platform engineering, or people say, uh, you know, DevOps is dead. Uh, and uh, we talked about bringing the developer experience and Cloud Foundry actually kind of bring the developer experience to the Kubernetes world as well. So can you also talk a bit about as companies are transitioning and we are talking about these, what roles is Cloud Foundry uh, any nice in playing to help those customers uh, with that transition or with this evolution of uh, cultural things like DevOps and platform engineering? You know, um... In the software industry, somehow is similar to the fashion industry. So every few years, we find new terms that we'll then, you know, create a lot of buzz around it. And I mean, we are talking about cloud, cloud automation, and and software platform operations. Well, back in the days, we called it hosting. You say that today, people laugh at you because we don't do hosting anymore, do we? Um, in general, um, there's one thing. I have to say, when you know declarative automation technologies entered the scene, uh, for example, Bosch for virtual machines or Kubernetes uh, for containers, that that there was a you know a big game changer because the predictability these technologies allow. For example, in data service automation, you need something that allows you to update uh, a thousand Postgres instances uh, if there's something like shell shock or log for shell. 
Now, with the N9 data services, you have multiple data services like whatever, Redis, RabbitMQ, and so on. So you have a multiple thousand data service instance um, uh, running, uh, you know, a, a multitude of, of VMs, and you need to update them fast and reliable. Now, how is this possible? How can you have one single automation code base um, and make you know automation work at that scale? Um, the the point with you know the term DevOps, which originates uh, I think from a uh, a Ruby based a conference in back in Belgium. I think the year was around two thousand nine, if I'm not mistaken here. So back in two thousand nine, we did use very different tools. Uh, we used, for example, Ops Code Chef or uh, or Puppet or anything like that. A more imperative approach to automation. So we did that as a company. Any nines was called differently at those days, but we uh, created a lot of virtual uh, virtualized clusters based on virtual machines. And uh, you know, utilizing Chef was our common strategy. So we had uh, database automation back in the day. Um, so what's the difference to today? I mean, looking at um, an operations group of five to 10 people, they'd be able to run hundreds of virtual machines, right? Where now the same team could run thousands, if not 10,000s of virtual machines. So obviously automation technologies have progressed and the declarative uh, automation technologies to me are, uh, you know, together with uh, changes in the data centers uh, in, in regard to having a programmable data center, you know, ephemeral virtual machines or ports and persistent disks, like, like automation paradigms in conjunction with those changes in data centers, they, they lifted DevOps or operations to the next level. So in that regard, it's fair to change wording and say DevOps is dead and whatever the new term is, is, is the new term. But basically, it's solving the same problem, just with different means. So uh, I wouldn't emphasize too much on, on the wording, but um, I would say behind the scenes, that's the progress um, that's causing people to say things like DevOps is dead. Just do, you don't want to run 1,000 database instances with Chef. At least we don't. No, very well said, and you, uh, your practical approach. I love the way we approach it. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, some upcoming events. Uh, of course, uh, KubeCon is coming up. You will be at uh, Postgres uh, conference as well. Let's uh, look at KubeCon for for a bit. Uh, what do you think is going to be uh, uh, the topic uh, or you know kind of focus this year, especially from the perspective of any nice presence and participation during the event? We spent the last um, the last one or two years, um, you know, writing operators and uh, managing the general question: How does data service automation change when uh, having Kubernetes as uh, the leading paradigm? So, what's the future of data service automation if you if you follow that assumption? So, we started to build our own operators. So, the Postgres operator is already there and uh, about to be general announced. But that's only half half of, of what you need. So in, in our analysis, looking at our larger environments, we are not talking about you know, a few Postgres instances, a few Redis instances, a few RabbitMQs. We are talking about, as I said, thousands. So this leads to the question whether, for example, operators should be co-located with applications. And in large environments, we don't think that this is meaningful because of situations like shell shock, where you don't want to wait for you know dozens of application developer groups to respond and uh, you know redeploy their their data service instances. So centralized data service automation on Kubernetes uh, then requires somehow you know integration with the application clusters, you know having remote control facilities, ensuring that there's network to network uh, com connectivity between those clusters, ensuring security. Uh, authentication, authorization, and all that. So those are research areas we are currently focused on quite a lot. And around KubeCon, there will be uh, several demos of products we introduce. And uh, um, I guess changes in that area uh, are interesting to observe. You will be uh, also attending Postgres conference. You'll be speaking there. Uh, talk a bit about your uh, attendance appearance there at the event. What, what are you going to talk about? Yeah, my talk at Postgres Con will be about uh, a recap of 10 years of uh, automating uh, Postgres. 
So we earlier mentioned, you know, there was a transitioning from, uh, well, even back in the days, we started to, you know, use shell scripts, uh, testing technologies like BCF G2, uh, later, uh, you know, Ops Code Chef and, and Puppet, uh, and then Bosch, Bosch, and, you know, at some point, you know, Kubernetes. So if you if you go through those last ten years and uh, and think about what were the challenges, what was the state of Postgres back then, um, what are the challenges when automating uh, Postgres, and for for also having in you know a rough indication, how many people do you or given a number of people, how many Postgres instances could you automate and maintain given a particular you know technology stack at a time. So going through the last ten years, and uh, you know, give a brief recap. That will be the talk at uh, at Postgres. And uh, I think for those people who've been around for the last ten years, that may be not so exciting, other than be reminded about the evolution and progress we've made in that area. But I think especially for for beginners and uh, more intermediate engineers who have not been there for ten, 10 years. It could be very valuable to see how changes in the data center, changes in virtualization, uh, and the introduction of of new automation technologies and paradigms, um, you know how they together change context and therefore also revolutionize uh, software operations over and over. And we're using Postgres as a, a good example because um, Postgres itself also changed and became more cloud friendly over time. And um, yeah, this, it's going to be a bit of history, uh, which might be interesting to anybody dealing with uh, database automation these days. When we talk about things like platform engineering, DevOps, and you know, we have seen the evolution, people get overwhelmed with things like Kubernetes. A lot of companies who are big, they do understand the terms. A lot of new companies, they get overwhelmed. They're like, hey, we need to have Kubernetes strategy. We need to have platform engineering strategy. Uh, what is your advice that when companies do look at term, they should not look at what technologies are there, but what they actually need. So what is your advice, how companies should approach uh, these changes, whether it's uh, terms or technologies? Well, first of all, um, you know, some people have seen us as a cloud foundry company. I, I've never seen us as a cloud foundry company. I've always seen us as a cloud automation company, software operation automation company. And uh, and to me, uh, you know, technologies is uh, it's just second. The first thing is always to understand you know, the mission, the mission is full lifecycle automation. You want to reduce as much of the human factor as possible because human resources are scarce uh, resources. They are hard to, hard to uh, uh, recruit, they are hard to train, they are hard to keep happy, uh, and, and therefore software teams are hard to scale. They become a limiting factor in, in producing software and, that, and thus producing company value. And that's the whole. That's the whole point we need to focus on in in all these technology discussions is uh, to understand how a particular technology provides more efficiency, uh, solving things in a in a more efficient way. So in the Kubernetes ecosystem, as we've you know looked at in several other videos, we've seen um, in contrast to Cloud Foundry, where a lot of you know the central idea was let's have a central platform as a service, establish it. Uh, central, central user management, tenant management, a marketplace to integrate all the services that uh, maintain state and have a, a wonderful application runtime that's agnostic to uh, frameworks and programming languages. Now, with you know, with the rise of Kubernetes, the, the different approach basically uh, you know succeeded, which is we are not looking at something that will solve the application development problem for anybody as a very opinionated stack, but instead, here's the framework to build your own platform and we grow an ecosystem with tiny bits and pieces uh, and you'll have to assemble your own platform. Now, I'm really not sure whether this is a good thing or a bad thing because now every customer I look at, they need to build their own Cloud Foundry based on Kubernetes uh, building blocks. And most of the companies I see are, uh, are absolutely overwhelmed with that challenge and um, and in a few years, they might look at very hard integration projects to get all those Kubernetes-based uh, um, workloads somehow be managed in order to get to a you know reasonable um, operational efficiency. Well, some companies do very well, 
and on there would be more products uh, you know bringing and showing or or giving the opportunity to have you know predefined software stacks but they will not be for everybody i mean as as soon as you start building opinionated stacks they won't be for everybody that's the nature of being opinionated so th i think the challenge of the time is first of all, grow the Kubernetes ecosystem by introducing more components that are still missing. And, and there are still those components uh, which are missing. Um, we, we see that when, for example, looking at data service automation at scale at Kubernetes, it's, it's still a very complicated matter. For example, in a lot of situations, you're looking at a Kubernetes cluster and eventually you're using Kubernetes to do on-demand provisioning of virtual machines because if you, if you need to isolate a service instance, you need to provide Kubernetes nodes that are isolated. So uh, uh, this in turn requires you to have control over the Kubernetes cluster, as well as the pods you provision, uh, ideally with uh, a similar language or, you know, let's say Kubernetes API based approach uh, so that you can automate those things together. Um, yeah, that would be that. And I think that, that that's generally a, a huge challenge out there. Julian, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me again. It was always a pleasure talking to you and, um, and see you next time.